If you're interested in EVs, you'll know that Hyundai is launching a bunch of fully electric cars here in the Australian market. But the brand is only now beginning their hybrid onslaught. And this is the first major Hyundai hybrid to come to Australia behind me. It's the Santa Fe Hybrid, the brand's seven seat large SUV. But it's gonna be followed quickly by two more hybrids in 2023. So Hyundai is gonna be building out this portfolio of hybrids, a large number of EVs, and probably a dwindling number of petrol and diesel vehicles into the future. So what does that all really mean? And how does this Santa Fe Hybrid drive? Well, I'm gonna let you know whether Hyundai's hybrids are any good in today's video and whether they make financial sense because this vehicle is six and a half thousand dollars more expensive than a V6 petrol Santa Fe and three grand more than the diesel. So will you get your money back? I'm gonna answer that question in today's video. And before we get started, hit subscribe. Chasing cars, honest reviews of your next car. Brought to you by Budget Direct. This is the Santa Fe Hybrid Highlander, the top of the range car, 69,550 plus on roads. That makes it 200 bucks cheaper than the Kia Sorento GT Line Hybrid and about six grand cheaper than a Toyota Kluger Grande Hybrid, although the Toyota is a bigger car, let's be fair. Now on the Hyundai, you can only get the hybrid in the mid-spec Elite or the top-spec Highlander. They are working on a cheaper version that could come later, but as is always the case, supply of new cars is really tight at the moment, and so Hyundai focused on the models that they say people actually buy. About two thirds of Aussies who buy a Santa Fe choose one of these top end models, which is quite interesting. And that's why this car has the camel interior. It's another 295 bucks, but it lightens the place up. It looks really lush, and we're sitting on Napa leather. But the hybrid Highlander's biggest problem is the existence of the Elite Hybrid, because the Elite is already so good. You get leather seats, lots of power adjustment, nice digital screens, Harman Kardon premium audio. About the only things you miss out on that are important on the Elite, in my view, is cooled seats, a sunroof, and reversing AEB. There are also a few other features that the Highlander gets just to itself, but I think most people will be able to live with the Elite specification. But let's see what we've got. So nice big round steering wheel, perforated leather on the Highlander, this big bridge center console, lots of buttons. So if you hate the trend of putting everything in a touchscreen, you will love the Hyundai Santa Fe. Shift by wire for the six speed torque converter automatic transmission in this car. The digital screen in front of you gives you plenty of info about the hybrid system. And over here, we've got a 10 and a quarter inch touchscreen only wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto due to Hyundai's long running feud with one of the smartphone manufacturers that continues to deny buyers wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which is pretty annoying. But the seat is actually really shapely, supportive and comfortable. I did 500 Ks in this car yesterday and was comfy the whole time I got out feeling fresh and that's the mark of a good seat. Material quality is really, really good in the Santa Fe. This car really shows just how far Hyundai's come in 20 years. This feels properly premium, near Genesis GV70 in terms of interior quality, which is pretty nice. Even the stereo sounds pretty good. Harman Kardon usually does, but I found it a little fickle to tune. I eventually got there and really enjoyed my music quality in this car. So yeah, the cabin's a nicely finished place, spacious and comfortable. What's the back seat like? As I mentioned before, this Santa Fe hybrid is the Highlander, and it's also been specified as a six-seater. Now, if you don't need to carry a million people, six seats is a really nice way to go because you get more comfortable outboard seats and you also get direct walkthrough access to the third row. Very convenient, and I'm gonna go there in just a minute. But this is also just a plush, premium-feeling back seat. Not only do we get that Napa leather, we also get soft materials up here on the doors. Sun blinds, so you don't need the aftermarket crap. You've got seat heaters in the Highlander as well, even here in the back row. Air vents, cup holders, USB ports, although they are the old USB port style. So you pretty much got everything you need. The Santa Fe falls into that category of cars like its cousin, the Kia Sorento, and also the Skoda Kodiak, in that they're kind of big mid-sizes or small large SUVs. And you get this nice little occasional third row. As you can see, Hyundai's packaged it really well. As I mentioned before, I'm six foot. That's what my mum keeps telling me and I fit back here just fine. I got okay leg room, head room, I can deal with it. The one kind of issue with the Santa Fe for this gen has always been that while you get a, an airbag that covers the glass back here, we don't have an additional body panel curtain airbag in the third, third row of this car. It's something I expect to see Hyundai fix for the next generation. The styling of the Santa Fe has remained the same after this car's quite handsome midlife facelift 
but Santa Fe spotters, I know you're out there, you're gonna see this car on the road with the hybrid badge. Also the different wheels, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, both specs have a power tailgate, the Elite and the Highlander. Once that opens promptly, you'll see the car has 571 litres of boot space, which is decent for kind of an upper midsize or small, large SUV. But keep in mind, Hyundai does have the Palisade, which is larger than this. Now, the third row seats, super easy to deploy. Anyone could do it. They're nice and light. And then you've got an occasional sixth and seventh seat, or in this case, fifth and sixth seat because of those captain's chairs that you can use mainly for other people's children. One nice feature of the Santa Fe though is that it still has an underslung full-size spare wheel, even in hybrid guise, partially because it's under the car and partially because the battery for the hybrid system is actually under the driver's seat, not here. So now to the big question for the Santa Fe hybrid. Are you gonna make your money back if you spend more on this engine compared to the 3.5 liter V6 and the diesel? Well, that very much depends on what kind of driving you do. But first of all, let's just go to the fuel consumption. Now, in an urban loop, I was actually able to quite easily get about six liters per 100 kilometers out of the Santa Fe Hybrid, driven for economy. So not charging around everywhere, you know, launching off from red lights, but driving it to get good fuel economy, which I think is what you'll probably do if you're buying the Hybrid. In the diesel in urban areas, you're gonna get around 7.5 liters per 100 Ks, or that's what I generally get and in the V6, you're looking more like 10 or 11. So if you do a lot of urban driving, you've got a chance of making your money back on this car in a few years time, but you'd need to be doing a lot of it, like 20,000 Ks a year for it to make sense. If you're a high miler on country roads, on highways, you're gonna find that the diesel is more sensical than this car. I was able to get about seven to 7.5 liters per 100 Ks out of the hybrid on country roads the diesel is gonna be a little bit better than that. And of course the diesel is three grand cheaper. That being said, let's not ignore the benefits like the fact the turbo petrol hybrid feels really refined, smooth, silky, and it has all wheel drive with a petrol engine and the V6 doesn't here in Australia. So that's fuel consumption. What about warranty? Well, the Santa Fe has a five year unlimited kilometer warranty. It's worth remembering the very similar Kia Sorento hybrid has a seven year warranty. I expect we'll see Hyundai upgrade their warranty sometime in the next few years, let's see. The car will have a cap price servicing offer and also a service plan that you can buy up front for a small discount and we'll put that pricing on the screen here once we have it. And lastly, in terms of insurance, in the last 12 months, the median budget direct customer spent $975 to comprehensively insure their new Hyundai Santa Fe. Everybody's situation varies and your premium will vary based on things insurers take into account like where you live and your driving history. The hybrid version of this Santa Fe arrives pretty late in the lifespan of this generation of the SUV. We know there's gonna be an all new Santa Fe revealed next year in 2023, and it might get to Australia before the end of next year or perhaps early 2024. So this fourth gen Santa Fe is being sent out with a bang with its best drivetrain yet, because the hybrid gives you broadly similar fuel economy to the diesel, but in a punchier and more refined package, and it also promises to be even more economical in town. Now, in all of its marketing, Hyundai is gonna talk about the fact that most people drive their large SUVs like this in the burbs. And I hate to admit, but that's pretty much true here in Australia, or at least most parts of Australia. While dreams of doing the big family road trip are a reality for many families, they often happen only once a year. And that's really the time where you're gonna reap the best from the Santa Fe diesel. The rest of the time, the hybrid is going to give you lower fuel consumption more of the time. But of course, it comes at that additional outlay on top of the diesel. So it's very important to do the maths on how much you actually drive and whether or not you're gonna be able to make your extra spend back in a reasonable amount of time. For families that do quite a few Ks, you should be able to break even on the hybrid compared to the diesel in a few years, which is reasonable. And if you plan to keep the car for quite some time, then you actually might end up ahead. So what are we talking about under the bonnet? The hybrid is actually a turbo petrol, which is pretty rare for hybrids, at least in Toyota world, and they account for almost all hybrid sales in Australia. So the engine is a 1.6 turbo. It's the same as what you see in like a Hyundai Tucson, the engine by itself makes 132 kilowatts of power, but then it's joined by a 44 kilowatt electric motor that's sandwiched between the engine and the transmission. So that means that the car actually shifts 
even when it's using electric power, which is quite interesting. Combined outputs when the systems are working together are 169 kilowatts of power and 350 newton meters of torque. So more power than the diesel, although a little bit shy on overall torque. However, my feeling after doing 500 kilometers in this seat today is that the hybrid never ever feels short of performance. It's happy to overtake with punch on a country road or on a highway. It doesn't feel lethargic or anemic at any point. I still like that relentless pull that you get from the Santa Fe diesel. And if you do do very long country miles in this car, you're putting 30, 40,000 Ks a year on the car, the diesel is still going to suit you better. But if you're like me and you spend an awful lot of your time running around the suburbs, uh, commuting, doing chores, dropping kids off at sport, all that sort of thing, the hybrid is going to be a really suitable partner. But what's it like compared to the benchmark hybrids of the industry, the Toyotas? Well, in some ways it's better and in some ways it's worse. You notice the worst bit straight away, and that's that when you take off from a set of traffic lights in the Santa Fe, it jumps onto petrol power almost immediately. Despite having quite a strong electric motor, it's like it doesn't want to rely on that motor and one and a half kilowatt hour battery for too long. Instead, it really reverts to that petrol engine quite rapidly indeed. It's actually once you're up to speed, you know, you've accelerated to 50, 60, 90, what have you, it will then cut off the engine and just glide on electric power and even accelerate gently on electric power once you're up to speed. And that still seems to work out in terms of fuel consumption, which is decent in the Santa Fe hybrid. The claim is six liters per 100 Ks. That would definitely buy us quite a bit of urban driving where this car is gonna be at its most frugal, but I found that even sitting on the highway, I was able to get seven liters per 100 Ks out of it without trying too hard. And in fact, even when I was trying to drive very athletically, the worst I did was 10. So definitely better than the V6 petrol, maybe a little worse than the diesel on country roads. The engine is also nice and quiet and refined in the Santa Fe hybrid. So you don't get that diesel clatter. In fact, it's barely noticeable most of the time. Only when the stereo is off do you kind of sense that there's even anything happening under the bonnet. Of course, that's one of the beauties of hybrid vehicles, generally speaking. As for the ride and handling, it's a little less crisp than the V6 petrol and the diesel, but it's hardly night and day. In fact, most people will never notice the subtle difference to the way the Santa Fe hybrid turns in. It's also on slightly smaller alloy wheels than the combustion versions of this car, which is a good change for Australia. The 19s don't look small or too uh, pedestrian. Instead, they still look big enough to fill the guards, but they give you additional compliance with uh, nice 55 series tires, which are quite chunky for this day and age, meaning that once you fall into a pothole on a broken up Australian road after three years of rain, you're not going to bend an alloy. The ride quality also benefits from the same improvements done to the Santa Fe at this car's facelift. When it came out in this country, the ride was very firm indeed, but it was given additional suppleness at facelift time, although there's still a little more road feel than in something like a Toyota Kluger. That being said, the car as a whole feels a little more cohesive, a little more premium than a Kluger, and even though the durability of Toyota's hybrids is enviable, the Santa Fe ultimately feels like a more expensive car when you sit in it and from behind the wheel. It's quieter too on course chip. Lastly, when it comes to safety, Hyundai do some of the best work in the game on the tuning of their systems, and in particular, the adaptive cruise and lane centering are really well done on this car. They make drives less fatiguing, but it's disappointing that only the top of the range Highlander has reversing autonomous emergency braking. So should you buy a Santa Fe hybrid? Well, the Hyundai Santa Fe is a good platform. We already knew that. And we actually end up in a really nice situation where I can tell you exactly which engine to buy based on what kind of driving you do. If you do low kilometers, the 3.5 liter V6 petrol is the right way to go because you just wanna save money up front and your ongoing fuel consumption costs are not that big of a deal. If you do high miles on the highway or on country roads, you want the diesel, hands down. But if you do high miles in the burbs, like a lot of Australian families do, then you're gonna want the petrol hybrid because not only is it smooth and torquey to drive, its fuel consumption is very low and it will pay off the difference to the other two engines within a few years time. But you're gonna to need to be doing like 20,000 Ks a year in order for that to make sense. Well, that's my opinion. Keen to know yours now. 
Let me know down below in the comments. While you're there, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, and as always, thanks for watching Chasing Cars.